all. We just, real nice guy, bonded. He wasn't that into sports. It's all sounding like stereotypes that, that I'm not making this up. Uh, he liked eclectic music, you know, he got me into David Bowie, that was his, his guy. Um, you know, we, we went out to, you know, had a car, so we went out to, instead of the, the, the pizza, you know, your pub, room pub, you know, he takes me to these, uh, like, European cuisine places, uh, you know, with, you know, just, just a little, you know, different, but, you know, he was a good listener, and, you know, we could talk to him about anything, got real close, and, uh, I know, you know, he was a good-looking kid, so, you know, girls would be coming all the time, making excuses, and, you know, saying, I don't need to stay around, I don't want to borrow his notes, or I want to talk to him about something, it was obvious they're all pretty. However. Girls. <laughs> yeah, I'll get to that. <laughs> you know, I, I, soon I got to be known as Steve's roommate. <laughs> I can't tell you how many girls came by and you say, oh, you're Steve's Here's roommate. the however. You're Steve's roommate. Your, your roommate's cute. <laughs> I, even, I even got that from a girl I was dating, so, you know. <laughs> you know uh, and he moved out. Yeah, so, so uh, you know, you know, moving on, I mean, it, it would be real easy to be kind of jealous and resentful, but we bonded. He was such a good guy, and, you know. You know, he was like, like somebody I could talk to about anything. You know, I talked to him about, you know, whether it's, you know, being unhappy about something with my family or girl problems. He would just stop what he was doing, listen. You know, it's almost, you know, it's kind of stereotypical about your, <laughs> like a girl having the gay friend that's always a good listener. But it, it just, it just happened that way. So the next year, you know, junior year, so we bonded so well that instead of moving out again, I said, all right, let's room together. So we did, and things were a little different, you know. He, you know, he wasn't as quiet. He wasn't as bubbly. I mean, he just a little more, kind of more introverted and low key, and he just seemed like something was bothering him. And finally, I asked him, "Said, are you okay, Steve?" And he said, "No, just things are just not the same. I kind of had a rough summer, and you know, I'm not sure I'm happy here. It's nothing. It's not about you, because he, he, he knew he didn't want to hurt my feelings. And so we had a, we had the same class. It was a sociology class." And uh, it was one of those classes that you needed to take as a, you know, get all your, you know, <clears throat> your non-core classes to get into the business school. So it was supposed to be easy, but it wasn't. So we had this professor who, you know, uses these terms like ideological haze or milieu of uncertainty, and I just didn't get it. <laughs> Steve got him, and we would talk all the time about no stuff. One day, it was before a midterm, and I got panicky. He wasn't there. I said, oh, I know he takes good notes, so I go to his desk. It's got all these these notebooks. They all look the same. They're like these blue denim colored books, uh, notebooks. So I just grabbed the first one and I kind of flipped to the back because I figured that's where yesterday's notebooks. So it turns out it wasn't his notebook, but it was his diary. <laughs> so of course, as Darlene told me later, she said, you should have just closed it and put it right back. <laughs> and I ask you, how many of you would have said, oh, just, just let me read a little bit. <laughs> if it's boring, I'll put it back. So, so basically what it says, and I'm not making this up, he talked about how miserable he was in the summer, confused about who he was, confused about his sexual identity. And then the last paragraph, he said, and last week I had my first homosexual experience with this guy who I knew, and things seem to be real clear in my mind now. So, first thing is, you know, I was kind of stunned, but then I thought about it, all the warning, all the signs were there that, you know, he, he was gay. And then the second thought was, uh, I knew the guy that he was talking to. He was kind of a, kind of a <clears throat> stereotypical looking Jewish kid with frizzy hair, large nose, and Mustache. And said, well, for your first experience, you could at least show somebody a little better looking. <laughs> <laughs> so that that kind of you know, and so my basic reaction I want to say is that I didn't feel offended or hurt or anything. I just felt empathy that somebody that I grew to be really close to as a dear close friend was suffering like this and found happiness. And that I knew it wasn't just a, a sinful choice because I mean, he got girls were throwing themselves at him, and he, he went out, but you know, it just just didn't happen for him. So now you know he finds uh, he's finding his happiness. So as it turns out, a week later he moved out, and he, he just told me, I, I told you I was unhappy. I just need to change. He didn't go into details. 
I didn't ask him. I didn't have to. Mm -hmm. um, so it kind of opened my. So my, my leaning is all towards you know homosexuals or there's nothing wrong with them. They, they deserve happiness. Third incident uh, or experience is uh, in my old firm at a CEO. Uh, we have offices all over the country. Yeah. Kyle actually might have been even interning for me at the time. Our, our, our home office is in Denver, and we had a, our CEO was this guy named Walt Brown, and his name is fit him perfectly. He was like a high school football star. I think he was like a high school All-American left tackle or something, but he was, he was a jock, um, masculine, big guy. And, but he was a nice guy. We connected over our love of sports, and wherever he'd visit, he'd stop by and chat. And one day, he just said, Oh, I, I'm not. I'm here so long. I, I'm, I'm not getting to work out, you know. And I said, "Hey, I got a guest pass. Come to my club and work out." Mm -hmm. and, okay, so he's all excited. We go to my gym. It was, it was Crunch Fitness, just mm -hmm. on Montgomery Street. We work out. Everything's fine. I look where he's working. He's doing his thing. And then as we come out, he has to have this look like he just ate some bad oysters or something. <laughs> I said, "Okay, are you okay, Walt?" And he said, "Come out." And so we walk outside, and he said. He looks and says, how can you work out in there? I said, what are you talking about, Walt? He says, aren't you uncomfortable? I said, Walt, well, what are you talking about? He says, the gays. He goes, do you know how many of them are in there? I said, well, I never really noticed this. I said, this is San Francisco and not Ohio. But, you know, why? Is that a problem? He said, they're all looking at me. They're all checking me out. I said, says, how can you be comfortable? Why, are you, why do you work out here? Try to make a joke and said, "Well, I guess it's because I'm not a huggy stud like you. Don't, don't bother me." He didn't think it was funny. <laughs> he goes finally goes. Then I'm in the shower and they're making eye contact with me. Boom, boom. And we leave and then. So two things is number one, the, to the term homophobic is not a slang term, but it, it's a real clinical. Uh, it's a real clinical condition. Two, uh, as much as I wanted to tell him I, that I disagree with him, not I did not because he was my CEO, but it goes again to respecting the opinions of others. And he's an intelligent guy. He's an MBA. He comes from Ohio, and he's probably a, I, there's a lot of people that feel strongly as he does. Uh, I don't know if you could. Do I need to tell you another conservative Midwesterner that I don't think I need to tell you who this is? Uh, <clears throat> the conservative religious political views, uh, and I'm not making a political statement here, it's just that it was easy to just find one person that had every single action associated with himself, and the, probably the, the biggest thing here is in, in, a, in a 2006 speech when he was a, a congressman uh, urging support for the Anti-Gay Marriage Protection Act, warned same-sex marriage would lead to the deterioration of the family, ultimately complete and utter societal collapse. Pretty strong. And there's some other, you know, uh, <clears throat> voted against employment non-discrimination, voted against don't ask, don't tell, supports, supports conversion therapy, which I understand some people still believe in. Uh, this, is, this is probably about like 2000, no, 2006. So, <laughs> the thing is, you could put Walt Brown's picture there too, and I, I, I'm, pretty, I'm like 90% sure that he'd be agreeing in all, all of those items. Um, so who am I to say, you know, my position is right and you're wrong? I mean, that's that's something that uh, be nice if Jim can help you know <clears throat> we can all, we, we can probably all relate to. In that, you know, you have a you have an opinion, you feel what's right, but you have people on the other side that you know just just are, are as equal as. Uh, on the other side. The next one. Yeah. So I, I was a little hesitant to put this on. Do you remember in uh, the Olympic Park bomber when in Atlanta? There was this guy named Eric Rudolph who he bombed a, a, he bombed some anti-abortion and he bombed a, a lesbian bar. Um, looking into it, uh, he was basically a, a, a <clears throat> kind of a, a white racist Christian fundamentalist in his views, but in his motivation, it listed fight against the government's homosexual agenda, which is, as I was saying, maybe there, there's a lot of people out there that still feel that the government is taking away from our, our biblical 
beliefs. Uh, resist the concerted effort to legitimize the practice of homosexuality, protect the integrity of American society, et cetera, et cetera. So it's not that, it, it, by putting them up there, it's almost like I'm saying that view is wrong, and I'm not. I'm just saying that there's have strong feelings when you, you, you remember the, how, how emotional people were at some of those, those meetings. Just think of people that are passionate about the, <clears throat> about homosexuality. Worldwide view, this is interesting. Uh, the, the green is where gay marriage is legal. The white and uh, Australia is also green too. But anybody can tell tell me your observations about the the, the, the light colored countries. Anybody anything obvious to anybody? The the countries that do not support same sex marriage. Muslims. What's that? Muslims. Yeah, good one, good one. Uh, how about China? <laughs> okay, that's the one that's uh, Kate Drop, you know, really caught my attention. In fact, uh, under further re research, uh, it was it wasn't in, until 1997 homosexuality was considered a crime. I mean, you could be arrested and put in jail if you were caught or suspected of being homosexual. And and during that same time, uh, you know. It's now long, it's trying to decriminalize homosexuality and also took it off 